Whoops. Don't worry, I'm going to temper the Like Nadine's honor students? That's not cool. Oh, I think it was recorded, if I recall correctly. I could you just put a blurb on our shoot. I think it'd be a great idea, actually. Yeah. Why not? Those are recorded. Just get a recording. I'll, uh, I'll get those from the website. Yes. All right, Nicholas is here, okay? Since it is just past the hour, why don't we get started? Okay, so welcome to the first lecture in a series to be held over the course of this and next semester, okay, so you'll notice here that I posted the schedule for fall 2016. Uh, basically, we will be running lectures every other week, beginning today, of course, with Nicholas Brocious. Um, and of course, in the weeks to come, you'll see there, normally they will be happening on Tuesdays. Of course, if there are scheduling conflicts, we will try and keep everybody up to date on uh, those changes. But generally, Tuesdays, 4 o'clock in Room 101, every other week is sort of what we have planned for this series this semester and the spring 2017 semester as well. <clears throat> okay, so you'll notice that on Tuesday, October 25th, the next lecture on, on the slate will be by our newest, one of our newest faculty members, American history educator, instructor extraordinaire, Darren Tuck. Okay, we'll be delivering a lecture entitled, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, Gender in the Grandstands in Progressive Era America which I believe is excerpted from your dissertation, is it not, Darren? No. Oh, no, not at all. Okay, it's not related to your dissertation at all. Anyhow, Darren is currently ABD and finishing up a dissertation at the University of Missouri, so we will all be very interested to hear what he has to say about his topic. Yes. <clears throat> Following Darren, two weeks later will be me, myself here, and I. Ha. Will be me, I will be talking about Hamlet, the first three acts of Hamlet, the great play by William Shakespeare. Uh, I did manage to publish an essay in the Shakespeare Quarterly. My reading of Hamlet, I did manage to publish in the spring issue of 2015, so I will be sharing some of my findings and conclusions and how I talk about that play um, there on Tuesday, November the 8th. I'd be very happy to do that, so I hope as many of you can join for that as well. And then finally, rounding off the lecture series this semester will be our wonderful Dean, Michael Kutz. Of course, his topic is still to be announced, but he will be ending it off for this semester. But I do want to emphasize, of course, we will be carrying on next semester as well. So I'm very happy to see some new faces here. Welcome. Um, please tell your friends all about this wonderful series. <laughs> and please bring more people to the table as we move forward. <clears throat> all right, so let me just briefly say that the goal of these faculty lectures is to provide a platform for the instructors at this school to share some of their research findings and research interests with other instructors and students alike. So many of us obviously do have pet projects that we attend to from time to time in each of our own respective fields of study. And because this is a place of learning, we strongly encourage both teachers and students alike to participate, either by giving talks, of course, or even attending lectures, in order to contribute to the intellectual life of this institution. <clears throat> so 
So one thing I want to mention, of course, is all of these lectures will be available on iTunes U for viewing in podcast form. Okay, so there's a link up there. Uh, Missouri State University channel. Yes, I think they have a foreign programs link or something like that. So if you can just click on that, you'll be able to find all of these lectures. They will be available in case you eager to relearn or rewatch some of the things that you've seen here. Um, what else did I want to mention? Yes, okay, that's good. All right, so let's begin here. So ever since he first learned about modern encryption techniques in an undergraduate number theory course, Nicholas Brocious has been fascinated by information security. Upon graduation from college, he came straight to Dalian, China, in the fall of 2006. He has now worked in the city for 10 years, the last six of which he has served as an LNU MSU IT specialist. He remembers the good old days when nearly everyone in China used a dumb phone and sites like Facebook and Google still worked. Much has changed since then. This past May, Nicholas finished up a Master's of Science degree in Computer Information Systems and a Graduate Certificate in Cybersecurity. Please welcome Nicholas Brocious. I just want to say thank you all for coming out for a topic that I typically would not bring up at the dinner table, um, but it seemed rather appropriate for such a talk as this. And one of the reasons that I decided to give this talk is because the word cybersecurity so often seems mystic or almost magical to people. It's like, what is that? And you put cyber in front of anything and people are oftentimes going to wonder, what is it you're talking about? Or what does that really mean? Uh, may, maybe some of you came out because you've heard about the recent Hillary Clinton email fiascos. Uh, maybe you've come out because you've heard of some of the um, large corporations that have been hacked and information's been leaked. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of that kind of stuff. Maybe you came out because you wanted to learn how to hack. I'm sorry, this is not uh, going to be the, the platform for that. Um, while many of those things do fall under the guise of cybersecurity, my goal here today is to just present a basic foundation of what is cybersecurity and, and then for you as a person, as an individual, what, what is good for you to know about it. So there will be a little bit that's technical. Um, just bear with me as we go through some of it because I'm going to lay out some of the threats that are out there, um, some of the dangers that, are, that you should be aware of. Um, and then I'm going to finish up with a list of, a nice long list of things that you can do um, in your effort to protect yourself when it comes to the online world. Now, before I get into all of this, um, I just want to make some brief comments. We'll have a little uh, demonstration, but also just talk on the, con on the idea of security in general, um, because you can't really get into cybersecurity unless, without talking about security. So, by a show of hands, is there anyone here that does not trust me? Feel free to raise your hand, I don't mind. Amir doesn't trust me. Yeah, okay. That, that, that might be right. So, okay, I'm not going to hack your accounts or anything. Nothing, nothing to worry about there. Okay, so of the people, I'm assuming if you did not put your hand up that you do trust me. Is there anyone that wears a wedding ring? Anyone at all? No one wears a wedding? Would you be willing to uh, come up for a demonstration, Daniel? Uh, I'm not sure you'll be able to put it out because ah. I've been there for about 10 years, my finger is bigger now. <laughs> so it's stop there. Do you think you can get it off? I don't know. For a demonstration? Hmm. <laughs> Uh, one show. Oh, maybe, maybe. Oh, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I'm not gonna make you take it off if you've had it on for ten years. <laughs> yeah. It's a big car, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, we'll get you that. All right. Well, while he's working on that, I have here a nice little lock, right? Um, and okay. I'm going to give this lock to Daniel because that is, that is his wedding ring and I'm also going to give him my wedding band. Okay. And I'm going to give you a couple of paper clips. 
and I want you to lock all of them on the lock. Okay. All right, now, now it's all locked. My, my assistant here has, has success. I'm, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you all heard the click that the lock made. Is anyone uncertain that the lock is indeed locked? <laughs> Could you, could you take your wedding band off and give it to me? No, no? okay. No, it can't. How about the paper clips? Can you take the paper I clips think off? I could. Okay, go ahead and take the paper clips off and um, hold them up for everybody to see once you've got them off. There's one. Okay. There's, there's two paper clips. You can mangle them. I, I don't need those paper okay. clips. There's a second one. And as you can see, paper clips came off the lock. So the lock could be useful for keeping the, the paper clips in place. Maybe you don't want to lose them. They're loose on your desk. Lock is sufficient for maybe keeping track of them, but it's not really a very good security measure for keeping the paper clips secure, right? Now, go ahead and take the rings off. Oh, I can't. Why not? <laughs> it's locked. It's locked? Yeah. Well, <laughs> anybody, anybody want to take those rings off the lock? Anybody uncertain that the that the lock is actually locked? He says he can't take them off. Anybody? No, no takers. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why can't you get the rings off the lock? Key. You need a key, right? Key. Maybe. I found this lock on a floor in an office. And quite frankly, I don't have a key. So, I got myself a couple of paper clips. See, he had everything he needed. I got myself a couple of paper clips that were identical to the ones that I gave to him, and, and there they are. Did you get this from Terminator? That's right. There you go. There's your ring. <laughs> Okay. Thank That's you, Daniel. Nice. I've never used my ring. <laughs> Neither one of us is going to go home tonight to an unhappy wife. <laughs> that would have been really awkward if I could not get that back off. The point I'm trying to make here, though, with this is that we oftentimes have a one track mind. We think lock, key. But you don't always need a key to unlock a lock. Sometimes there are other ways to attack a problem or a security measure. We'd all agree that a lock is a security measure, yeah? Sometimes a lock is a good security measure. Sometimes, however, it's not, as I just demonstrated. If this lock had been used to secure files in an office, which it may have been used for at one point in time, I just demonstrated that it could have been unlocked in the space of the time that someone would get up and go to the bathroom and come back. It's a pretty scary thought, um, but you really have to consider when you, when you want to implement a security measure, there's a few questions you have to ask. What is it that I'm trying to secure? How sensitive is it? What security measures are sufficient for securing whatever it is that I'm trying to protect? Um, some other questions you might ask would include um, who should have access? Should I be the only person with access? Should multiple people have access? How long does it need to be protected? Not everything that is secured needs to be protected forever. Um, these are some questions, and they're certainly not all of the questions that could and should be asked when it comes to considering the idea of security. Um, but when it comes to security, we should consider the fact that there's more than one way to skin a cat. I, I don't know where that phrase exactly came from or how it came about. I'll leave you to speculate on that. Uh, but when it comes to security measures and you, and you start to implement security measures, it's good to consider how might someone go about bypassing the security measure. You could open this lock with a key so someone could try to steal your key from you and then maybe put it back on your person without you noticing. They could pick the lock. They could cut the lock, get some bolt cutters, and just cut it open. 
Uh, there's lots of different considerations that need to be made when you're looking at security. So before I get into what is cybersecurity, let's look at some things that it's not. First off, it's not a bunch of nebulous hocus pocus. When, when we talk, like I said, when you put the word cyber in front of everything, all of a sudden it seems to become mystical or even somewhat magical. But it's not. It's not just a bunch of hocus pocus. It's, it's not all online. There is plenty of the element of cybersecurity that is offline. It's not just someone else's problem. Cybersecurity is a, a venture that needs to be invested in by many, many parties. It's definitely not what you see on TV. And let me just pause here for a second because this is one of the things that gets my goat. I like to watch crime shows. I don't know about you. I like NCIS. And um, it just drives me wild when the good guys find this encrypted device or this encrypted data or file and they go, oh, we got someone who can take care of that. And they take it back to the shop and they give it to this guy. And voila, in a matter of minutes, oh, yeah, it had some wicked, nasty encryption on it. But nothing gets past me. And they have it unlocked in a matter of seconds. And you're like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Not if you're using good, good encryption. And let me tell you, the bad guys are probably using good encryption. So that is just ridiculous. Um, another thing that you sometimes see is they're going to hack into someone else's system. And they start punching a bunch of buttons and this progress bar comes up. And it starts going across the screen. That is completely and totally false. There is no, you, there is no A to B with a sequence of steps that are followed in between that can be measured. There's no progress bar. A lot of times, that kind of an attack takes a lot of planning and a lot of time beforehand, before you can ever even get to the point where you can break into the system. Um, it's not a one and done deal. Cybersecurity is not, you don't go, when you go to the bank, you don't just go and lock up your valuables in a safe deposit box and then walk out and say, okay, you can all turn off the security cameras now or the guards can all go home because my valuables are now locked in the safe. You, you want them to continue protecting your valuables, right? You want them to protect your valuables 24-7. In the same way, cybersecurity is something that has to be invested in all the time. It's not a one and done deal. It's not incomprehensible. Um, like I said at, at the very beginning, it's not hocus pocus. It is something that can be understood and should be understood. So what is it? It's a systematic security approach. Cyber security. It's security. That protects digital assets within seven different domains. So not only are we looking to protect our information, but we actually know I need to protect it here, 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 all seven domains, and as it travels between those domains. It is a joint effort with everyone who has access to that information. That includes you, that includes the IT people, that includes the people who write the applications that you use online, that includes your internet service provider. It's a layered defense. It's not just one security implementation. Like I said, you go to the bank, you have valuables that you want to protect and keep safe. The bank has cameras. The bank has security guards. The vault has security measures and locks and stuff. Once you get inside the vault, each of the boxes has security measures. There's multiple security measures that are implemented to establish security. Cybersecurity is no different. You still have multiple security measures that layer one on top of the other to provide a certain level of security.
And like I said, it's a continuous effort. It's non-stop, a continuous effort. And lastly, it's definitely something to be understood and implemented. So, again, like I said, at the end of this talk, I'm going to give you a long list of some things that you can be doing to protect your digital assets online. Let's look at just a couple of definitions. Security is the protection of an asset from unauthorized access. Cybersecurity is going to be, for the purposes of this discussion, is going to be defined as the protection of a digital asset from unauthorized access. So now we're starting to already uncover some of these layers. What am I protecting with cybersecurity? My digital assets. That could be information about me. That could be my online banking records. That could be my computer itself. All of these things, because information that's on my computer is stored digitally. I need to protect all of this digital information that's considered private information to me. Access. When you want to talk about access, you have to consider what kinds of access. There's view access. Who has the ability to view this information? Who should have the ability to view? Um, consider when you send an email. And say the email has a picture inside that you want to use for an advertising scheme or something. Or, let's bring it home, you send an email to the copy room with a test. Who should have access to view the email of your test file? Hopefully, you and the copy room attendant. Who should have access to modify the contents of your email? We hope only you. Hopefully the copy room attendant is not going to modify the contents of your test. But considering a digital, in this example, a digital copy of a test that's sent to the copy room could in theory be modified by the copy room attendant. So this is always a consideration. Who should have access to modify? How can I restrict that access? Now if I give her a hard copy, she could recreate it on the computer, but it becomes a little more work. Who should have access to use this material? Well, hopefully, the copy room attendant has access to use the test for, making, for the purpose of making copies. But hopefully, none of the students are given access to use the test for the purposes of preparing for the test that's coming up. Um, and then who should have access to destroy this information? In an email, you have to consider that there's a middleman the email goes from you to the copy room attendant, but it has to travel over someone's network to get there. It has to go through an email service provider. All of those people potentially have the ability to view, modify, use, or destroy the contents of that email. So these are considerations that need to be made when you're thinking about access, unauthorized access. Protective measure is just an implement that restricts access. So it, it may not be sufficient in and of itself, but when you combine it, when you layer your defense, when you combine it with other measures, it may be sufficient to protect um, a document from being viewed or modified or accessed or used. Maybe you want someone to be able to view, but you don't want someone to be able to edit. For example, take a company that places its contact information on its website. Hopefully, the general public has access to that information to view, but you don't want the general public to have access to modify. That's where hackers come in and they deface websites. They go in and they access information they're only supposed to have view rights for, and they make changes. So put protective measures in place that restrict that kind of access. And I've already mentioned defense in depth. Make sure you layer those protective measures to provide a better level, a better degree of protection than maybe any one of the measures provides individually. Now I mentioned there are seven domains, and these are the seven domains. Now I'm assuming that most of you can't actually read any of that from back there, so I'm going to highlight them one by one. Um, the first domain is you, 
This is the user domain. This is before you get on the computer. So, conversations you have with people. Remember, information that's stored digitally sometimes exists up here, too. We share information verbally sometimes. Um, we also have to be wary ourselves of what people hear from us, see from us. If someone tries to call you on the phone, you're responsible for protecting the information that's considered private to you or to your business. The second domain is the workstation domain, and here we still really haven't moved past the user too much. This is the computer you use to access the internet or your local network, or it could be any mobile device, a phone, a tablet that's used to access the internet. Information has to be protected on this computer, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means as well. So these two domains are really going to be the focus of my security recommendations. Uh, but for the sake of covering the whole topic of cybersecurity and really what it means to protect information, we also have the LAN domain. This is your local network. So in our building here, there are some web pages that you can only access if you're here in our building. If you go home, you can't access them. That's because we have a network that is accessible only from here. That's the local network. We need to be able to secure information when it's on our local network or moving around our local network. The next domain is the LAN to WAN domain. This is the border between your local network and the internet. For most of you at home, this is your router. This is the piece of hardware that sits between you and the internet. You want to be able to protect yourself at this level as well so that people cannot attack you coming in and hopefully if your technology is good enough you may even be able to stop some attacks that are trying to get out you have the WAN domain represented here by a cloud this is the internet and I hate that people use the term cloud although I use it myself um, because it's not a cloud it's a network it's a bunch of computers that are connected to one another when someone says, I put my files in the cloud, all they are really saying is, I stored my files on someone else's computer. That's it. It's on someone else's computer. We want to be able to protect, we want assurances that our information is protected in the cloud. A lot of times this comes with encryption, your VPNs. It helps to hide or conceal or keep secret your information as it travels through the internet. The remote access domain is what's referred to as um, anybody who has the ability to access your network from off-site. So if I'm, if I'm a businessman traveling and I need access to files on the company servers, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll connect to a VPN that brings me back to the company servers and gives me access to the LAN the local network. We want to protect this domain because attackers, hackers, will also try to remotely get into the local network because once they're in the local network, then they can do more and start to look for files and try to get into people's systems, but they have to get into the local network first. So it's important to protect this remote domain. And the seventh domain is the systems and applications domain. And this domain is really um, just the online applications that you're accessing. These servers might be located in the cloud. They might be located in your LAN. But take, for example, Gmail or Yahoo Mail or any online mail service, even your Missouri State email. These services are provided by a computer somewhere else, somewhere located remotely. And these computers that are offering these services need to be secured. If they're not, then an attacker might be able to break into them and maybe get a whole bunch of credentials, a whole bunch of logger, um, login usernames and passwords. So it's, it's necessary to protect your systems and your application domain. You don't want attacks against these kinds of services um, because information could be lost. Um, 
the service itself could be interrupted. Um, there's, there's lots of complications and a lot of these um, complications could work out to a monetary loss for a company. Uh, not all things are equal. Different assets call for different security measures. Take for example, KFC's 11, it, the original, the secret original and herbs and spices. I don't know if any of you have heard, but the apparently, supposedly, the, the original 11 herbs and spices have been leaked. Um, and it, it actually had nothing to do with a cyber attack someone found an old journal related from one of the colonel's relatives that had helped him get set up in his chicken business and in the journal was a page that had written down 11 herbs and spices and it just went right down the list with measurements for each one you can find it online now kfc still claims it's not, it's not exactly what they use today <laughs> but it may be the original is what they said <laughs> um, Hopefully, you're going to put some pretty serious security measures on things like um, trade secrets. Those, those 11 herbs and spices would have been considered a trade secret. You don't want that kind of stuff getting out. Um, but like I said already, the contact info, if you want to call your local KFC to place an order, hopefully the public has access to that kind of stuff. Um, different assets have different security lifespans. Take the uh, test paper, for example. When you create your test, you guard that file with your life until the day that it's handed out to all the students. Once it's handed out to all the students, it is now public knowledge. There's no longer a need to protect that information. In fact, you want the students to have access to that information. So until test day, that test paper is top secret. But once test day comes, that test paper is no longer top secret. All the students know all the questions that are on that test paper from that moment on. KFC would have loved to have keep its 11 herbs and spices secret forever, but it just couldn't seem to do so. Um, on that point, some people have said that they've tried playing around with those 11 herbs and spices that were on the list. And they said, with a little MSG added, it, you can make something that's almost indistinguishable from KFC's chicken. So, there you have it. Uh, different assets have different lifespans. Choose, sometimes choosing security measures will be affected by this. If you only need to protect it for a short period of time, you may not need the same security measure that you would need to protect information that needs to stay secret forever. Not all protection measures are equal. Um, when it comes to encryption, there are varying degrees of encryption. Some encryption um, is very weak. Caesar cipher, if you know what a Caesar cipher is, it just takes the alphabet and it shifts the letters a fixed number of positions. So maybe an A becomes a D, a B becomes an E. And, and you just go down and you write your message. That's a very, very weak form of encryption. It can't really even be called encryption. It's a cipher. Um, but you have more modern levels of encryption that are oftentimes very secure, but even within those different kinds of encryption, there's different levels of security. We have what are called key sizes. So if you use a small key, your encryption level is going to be relatively low. If the larger the key gets, the higher the level of protection offered by the encryption scheme. Some links in the chain of information flow are more susceptible to leakage. I showed you seven domains there. But even within the user domain, you have to consider information travels from one place to another, even within one domain oftentimes. And the path that that information takes has to be secured. And it's really important to consider where are the weak points? What are these weak points? In our legal system, this is an important thing because we have to document where evidence has been. We need a chain of evidence showing this was here, it was handled by this person, it was picked up by this person at this time, he used it for this. 
Um, and this is very important for us in our legal system for establishing where things have been proof that something hasn't been changed. In the same way, you want to be able to ensure that your digital information is protected from changes or from modifications or from just leakage. So you have to consider where is it going, how is it getting there, and then protecting all of the different points along the way. Attacks may be direct, they may be indirect. Um, like I mentioned here, uh, this, isn't, this isn't the greatest example, but I mean, a key could be considered a direct attack against the lock. Or someone who has a, a master skeleton key, that's a direct attack against the lock. But cutting the lock is a bit of an indirect attack because you're not actually unlocking the lock, but you're still getting access to the information. When it comes to digital information, you may type in your password into a website and your password is what you think is keeping you safe, protecting you. And if someone wanted to break in, they'd have to guess my password, right? Well, not necessarily. What if, what if they steal your password as it's moving in an encrypted state between you and the service? Now they have an encrypted form of your password if they can find a way to decrypt that, they have access to your password in plain text. And thereby, they don't have to sit and try and guess your password. They're going at it another way. They're attacking it from the side and saying, no, I'm going to attack the encryption that was used to conceal this password and try to get the password that way. So you have to remember there's more than one way to skin that cat. And I'm not sure why I ended up there. Oh, I know why it's there. Sorry. I wasn't supposed to pop up until later. Some attack vectors that might be taken. Social engineering. A uh, social engineering attack is just one that simply tries to trick you into disclosing information. This could be a phone call, someone pretending to be the IT guy from the company and he says, sorry, I've got a couple of passwords listed here for you and it's causing some problems in the system. We're trying to figure out which one is your correct password. Could you just tell me what your password is so we can get this all straightened out? And, and you, you rattle off your password. I hope not. But you rattle off your password and you've just given out information and someone tried to trick you into believing something about himself that wasn't true so that you would disclose information so you would feel comfortable giving up that information. Uh, you also see this in the form of, uh, we'll talk in a little bit about email attacks. People try to trick you into clicking on something. Scareware. Scareware is a great social engineering attack. You see an advertisement that comes up on your screen and it says, you've been infected by a virus, click here to remove it. It's a social engineering attempt. They're trying to deceive you by making you think you have a virus when you may not, so that you'll click on the link and infect yourself. At least that's the goal. Account recovery options. Oh, these are a terrible, terrible, terrible one. Um, so often, account re recovery options rely on discoverable secrets. What was your mother's maiden name? Now, in the United States, that kind of information is available in public records. If someone really wants to find out what your mother's maiden name was or is, those records are available in public offices to anybody who will come and ask for them, or maybe even pay for them. But these kinds of things that are easily discoverable are terrible terrible account recovery options. Be very careful when you select these. Um, password cracking. Someone could sit there and try to break into your account by typing in your username and, pa and different passwords over and over again. Uh, but this oftentimes, most applications now protect against this by locking you out after maybe five failed attempts. Um, our school's websites will lock you out after three. If you fail three times, 
you're cut off for 30 minutes. That, that's not the only way to attack passwords. If someone can break into the application, remember that seventh domain? If someone can break into the Gmail servers and get a list of usernames and passwords, now the passwords most often are not in clear text. They've been garbled up and changed into something else so that you can't see what they are and you can't reverse it. But you can always go back from the original password, you can always get back to that garbled up text. And what they do is they compare the garbled text. Well, an attacker might be able to get lists of these garbled texts that represent a hash of the password. Rather than trying to log into the system over and over again, they might actually attack that list and just try multiple combinations outside of the system on their own computer. They might try to generate that same hash, and if they can find one that matches, then they have a password that will work to log into that person's account. Oftentimes, when you hear about corporations who've been compromised and password lists have gotten out, this is the kind of thing that they're concerned about. Um, it's not that the passwords are actually available to the hackers yet. They, they have information that they can use to confirm whether or not they found a correct password, but they have to keep trying. And they'll use dictionary attacks, so they'll use common words. If they know you, they may tailor that list to things specific to you, to terms that you know or use or find valuable, things that you appreciate, Shakespeare, um, different things like this. Change your password. <laughs> That's right. Change your password. If your passwords have anything to do with Shakespeare, Amir, uh, it's probably not a good idea to keep those passwords around. Um, phishing. Phishing is, uh, is a social engineering attack that is used through email. Uh, most of you probably know what phishing is. Someone sends you an email. That maybe it looks like it's from a delivery company. They say, you have a package that you, uh, that you need to come pick up. Click on this link. <laughs> and the link takes you to a malicious website with, with viruses and stuff on it. Uh, this is a social engineering attack called phishing. Farming. This may be a little bit less known attack. Um, but what you do in farming is you... Um, Take and rather than just f make a fake site that looks like another site, you actually you, you make a fake site that looks like another night another site, but then you poison the person's computer so that when they try to go to the real site, it actually sends them to the fake site, and you're none the wiser. It doesn't show in your address bar. So if someone can get into your system and attack you directly from by installing malware on your system, they can actually make your computer point somewhere else to a fake site. This is one that it, it gets harder to detect some of these attacks. Eavesdropping. I think we all, most of us here know what eavesdropping is just every day. Someone listens in on your conversation. The same thing is possible on computer networks. The computers are talking to one another, and an attacker may sit on the network, and if he's within earshot, so to speak, of the two computers talking, he can watch the data as it goes past. And he can eavesdrop, he can watch the transactions between those two computers. This is why things like HTTPS are important. That little S, it stands for secure. Um, your VPN is helpful in protecting you against these kinds of things. Broken encryption. Like I mentioned already, just because someone says they're using encryption doesn't mean that it's secure. There are weak encryption schemes out there that were developed years ago. Some of them can be broken in seconds, minutes, hours, days. And if your information is sensitive, then you want to make sure you're using appropriate encryption. Um, and fortunately, many browsers will tell you if the encryption that's being used by a website is outdated. And then finally, in infected pages. Infected web pages. One example of this is um, 
MySpace had a problem with this. And it's not that MySpace created the infected web page. What had happened was one of the MySpace users wrote himself a nice little script and he planted it in one of his posts. Now a script is code that's meant to be run by the web browser when you load the page. So he posted this message, his friends viewed his post and the script would run on their computers. And what the script would do is it would add him, the person who created the script, to the viewer's friends list. He wanted to see how many friends he could, he could stockpile in a short amount of time. Well, if your friends can see your friends' messages, then they view this person's script and automatically it just adds them as a friend to this guy. And then their friends view the message indirectly and they get added. And then their friends view the message indirectly and it just multiplies like rabbits. And he brought down pretty much the entire MySpace site. Um, just with all the traffic that he was generating through users being added to his account. Uh, and it caused tons and tons of problems. Um, but there are many, many um, concerns to be aware of. Uh, for example, an infected page could make calls to another page that you have open in your web browser. So, for example, you're doing your online banking, yada, 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 yada. And for whatever reason, your bank doesn't secure its web pages properly. Um, I hope that's not the case. But then you open an email and it says, oh, I'll click this link. And you go, oh, I don't know what that is. And you click the link and it takes you to this web page and it's like, oh, sorry, you ended up here in error. But what you don't know is that page made a call to your bank's page. And it said, transfer all of his money to me. And that page remotely, because you were, because you were logged into your bank already, your web browser just says, hey, the web browser is making a call, and yes, I've already logged in. So it makes the call to the bank saying, hey, transfer all this money to me. The bank says, okay, because you've already logged in. So infected web pages are definitely, definitely something to be wary of. All right, so I promised you I would get to some protective measures. I'm sure I've scared some of you um, a little bit here and there with some of the things that I've said. Um, and when it comes to infected pages like your bank, hopefully your bank is, is on top of things and they protect against those kinds of attacks. That is the kind of thing that your bank has to protect against. That's not, aside from logging out of the banking website, there's not much you can do to protect against that attack. The MySpace attack, other than not using MySpace, there was no preventative measure or turn off JavaScript. But then the MySpace page probably won't work. Uh, so the, some of this is the responsibility of IT people in the industries providing these services. Um, but some of it is our responsibility. There are some things that we can do. One of them is to be cautious and not careless. When you're working on your computer, just be aware of the people around you, especially if you're working with sensitive information. Um, be aware that people could be watching what you're typing on your keyboard. They could see what's on your screen. This is just common sense, but it's, it's still one of the things that is applicable to the user domain. Uh, don't, don't go logging into computers that you don't trust. All right? If you want, you want to go check your email, so you go to the internet cafe and you log into your email, how do you know that that computer is not infected and your credentials aren't being just skimmed right off? Someone could have very easily stolen your credentials as you typed them. Um, so be careful. Don't, don't just go logging in and providing sensitive, typing in any kind of sensitive personal information on computers you don't know or don't trust. If you must write your password down, I really strongly you not to but if you must don't leave it where anyone can access it don't share it with anybody and we've all heard it none of us obey it but it's good practice not to reuse passwords at the very least if you're going to reuse passwords classify the websites that you're using them for into 
this only gets used for really sensitive stuff. Don't use your banking password in Facebook. It's just not a good idea. It's asking for problems. Um, if it's a site you don't care about and, and you have other sites you don't care about, sure, go ahead. Use the same password for those. Um, but really, the best practice is don't reuse passwords at all. Choose your account recovery options carefully. <laughs> I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, oftentimes, if I look through a list and I cannot find a question, a security question, that is to my liking, I'll just pick stuff that I don't have an answer for, and I'll put random junk in for the security question, and then that, that I'll maybe document in a pa password manager or something. Um, so that if I ever come back to it and I go, I don't know what that is, I can look it up in a password manager. But if that's the case, my password's probably in the password manager too. Uh, use a passphrase. Um, we see the term password on, in front of all of these authentication things. It's a terrible idea to use a password. Use a passphrase. Um, so people who are really, really... Um, security minded and quite frankly paranoid about their security will tell you don't use anything less than 20 characters. Now if you're trying to think of a 20 character word it's, it's kind of pointless but I'm sure we all have phrases that we can come up with whether it's something we just saw in a movie and it's just memorable famous quote from someone. Um, use passphrases, portions of a famous quote. Use a passphrase, don't use a password. Um, it's more secure. Um, Use two-factor authentication. I don't know if you know what this is or not, but two-factor authentication typically ensures that to get into your account, you have to know something and you have to have something. So for example, you have to know your password. So I go to log into my Gmail on a computer I've never used before. It asks me my password. I type in my password. Done. Before it will let me in, it will ask me for a code, a six-digit code that I can get off of my phone. Now, sometimes these codes are texted to you. I happen to use an app called Google Authenticator. It generates a new code every 30 seconds. And that code can only be used one time. So that code represents something I have, which happens to be my phone. So in order to log into my account, I have to provide my password, which I know, and I have to provide the code which is generated and displayed for me on my phone. Now my password might be out in the wild, but that six digit code can only be used once. So that second factor is helping to provide a layer of protection. Someone with my password still can't get into my account without a six digit code that's generated every 30 seconds. Confirm domain names. When you're clicking on links and you, you look at the address in the address bar, before you go and type your password in, especially if you're logging into a, a system, just look up at the top. Does it actually say gmail.com or google.com if you're expecting to log into your Google or your Gmail? Does it actually have the correct domain? And be careful because someone who's trying to attack might try to deceive you and maybe instead of writing Google, they write, I don't know, Goog5 instead of an E. So it looks like Google at a glance, but when you look closely, you're like, oh, no, that's not Google. Um, so just be, be careful. Look at the domain names. Check them out. Uh, connect only to trusted networks, and when, when possible, when you don't have any other options, or even when you do sometimes have options to use open networks, use mobile data. If you're in the coffee shop, sitting down and connecting to their Wi-Fi, there is no guarantee that they have secured their wireless network. Anybody else on that network could be sitting there trying to watch what's happened on the network, trying to gather information. Your packets are traveling through the air. There, there's, there's no cable that someone has to tap into. All they have to do is be in the room with you to capture these packets. So be careful if you're um, connecting to untrusted networks. If you're connecting to an untrusted network, use a VPN. Use a VPN. Don't trust that they have taken the measures to secure their own network. Um, and if you've got mobile data, just, just turn your mobile data on. Um, 
this will probably provide most, most of the security you're going to need. So just forego the open Wi-Fi connection if you have mobile data to spare and use your mobile data. Don't bypass warnings about security certificates. <laughs> have you ever been browsing a web page and it says, there's something wrong with this website security certificate? Don't ignore those. First thing you should do is check your clock on your computer. If your clock is wrong and the date is completely off, it can cause these kinds of problems. If your clock is right, go away from that website. Don't, go, don't continue, especially if you're expecting to transfer or receive um, any kind of private information. Browse cautiously. Like I've said already, be careful where you click. When you're clicking on email, links and emails, be careful. Be careful because it's possible that websites may contain malicious scripts. They may try to steal cookies off of your computer that have authentication credentials in there so they can access a banking website as you or something like that. If you're going to um, access something that you're unsure of, a lot of times what I will do is I will use the private browsing feature in the browser because the private browsing feature provides, it's like a sandbox and everything that you're doing in your main window, if you're logged into your email, is not accessible from the private browsing window. So use the private browsing window if you're unsure of something. If you're not sure where it's going to take you, open in a private browsing tab. That way it can't interfere with other stuff that you're already logged into. Install, update, and run your antivirus software. Can't stress this enough. It's important to have antivirus software installed. It's there to catch bad things. So install it. You have to keep it updated. So you have to update the virus, the antivirus software itself, and you have to update the virus definitions that it uses to detect viruses. Keep those two things up to date and run regular scans. Beware of scareware, I've already mentioned this. My dad, when I was uh, home last, uh, no, it was actually when he came to visit me here, um, told me he, he thought his phone was infected with a virus because he had got, he had seen something pop up on the screen um, and ultimately it just turned out to be an advertisement that was saying, hey, you've got viruses, install this app. <laughs> And I said, just ignore, he said, I didn't, I didn't do anything. He said, I didn't even click on it. I said, yeah, just ignore those. That's scareware. They're trying to get you to install something that may itself be malware. Install browser and operating system updates. If you use IE, if you use Chrome, if you use Firefox, keep the browser up to date. Because web browsers can have security risks, security flaws. As these are discovered, the developers patch them and release updates to the web browser. These updates help to keep your browser secure. And then your operating system, Windows or Macintosh, the, the Mac, uh, what are they calling it now, the Apple OS? The Mac OS, that's what they're calling it now. They've changed the name recently. Um, Linux, it doesn't matter what you're running, keep it up to date. When you've, got those, when you've got a little notification in the bottom that says, you have Windows updates, install them. Because none of the operating systems, I'm sorry, not even, not even Apple's or any Linux operating systems are 100% secure. There exist security flaws that are, are oftentimes unknown until they're discovered. And once they're discovered, the developers patch these leaks. And those patches come out to you in the form of, of updates, operating system updates, oftentimes security updates. So install those. It's good to have them. Look for HTTPS on websites when you're browsing. This helps to secure information as it's being transferred. So folks like your internet service provider can't mess with it. Um, and people, if you're, if you're connected to a public Wi-Fi spot in a coffee shop, if it's HTTPS, people sitting there aren't going to be able to see this traffic going back and forth. Um, in the same regard, I said connect to a VPN. So if you, if you have to access a site um, 
with HTTP and you have a VPN on hand, connect to the VPN first. It'll help to secure your traffic at least to the point where it gets to the VPN provider and then it will be public again. Um, so hopefully you can trust your VPN provider and you can trust the point at which it leaves their servers and goes back out to the internet. Be careful what you open in email, I've already said. Think before clicking that link. Think again. Do I really need to click this link? Now, if it's on a web page you trust, there may be nothing to worry about. But if it's a web page that was recently attacked, it's possible that a hacker defaced it or even added links that are malicious. So just, just think twice before you click links, especially if you don't know where it's taking you or you've never been there. Be careful what you plug into your computer. USB devices are so popular for being a vehicle for viruses these days. Um, so be really careful what you plug in. Guard against physical access to your computer. An attacker who has physical access to your computer has everything he needs. That's all he needs, physical access. Um, physical access is almost equal to unfettered access to all of your personal information on that computer. Now, if your computer is encrypted, there might be a time factor, but encryption can be broken with time. So, essentially, given enough time, that person will still be able to gain access to your personal information that's on your computer. If you have the option of encrypting your system, do it. It's, it's a very good idea. It can put you in a sticky spot if you ever need to recover information. I will say that. Um, because if you encrypt your system and something goes wrong and you need to recover files, mm -mm, they're encrypted. They're not going to be accessible, but it helps to protect in the event that, say, your computer's stolen. You're going through the airport and someone just picks up your bag and walks off with it. If your information's encrypted, you're a whole lot better protected um, because that information's going to be hard, probably not worth that person's time. They'll just wipe everything and take the computer and use it for whatever they want. Be wary about plugging USB storage devices into other systems. So you have your own USBs. Again, they're vehicles for viruses. Just be careful where you plug them in, who you give them to. Um, as much as possible, only plug your USB sticks into computers you trust. Configure your privacy settings in your social media accounts. This is one of the big, big ones. Um, like I've said already, a lot of security questions, a lot of account recovery options have information that can be gleaned from your social media accounts. Open your social media accounts, find out what privacy settings exist, and then once you find out what privacy settings exist, go through and set them the way you want them. And don't do it just once, check back every once in a while because these companies make changes and they update, they add new privacy settings, they take some away. Go back and check every so often just to see are the settings still configured the way that I want them to be set. Uh, when in doubt, good advice. If, if you're not sure of something, go ask someone who knows. Um, and I, I, I add this here because I'm inviting anyone here that has questions to come ask me when you run into security issues. Like I said, I can't cover everything here today. There's no way I can completely cover the topic of cybersecurity. Um, but when you're in doubt, go ask someone who knows. And finally, be vigilant. Don't do it just once. Don't run your virus scan once. Run it regularly. Don't check your, mo your privacy settings and your social media sites once. Check them on a, on a semi-regular basis at least. Every time you get in an update from Facebook saying, hey, we made changes. Go in and check and see what the privacy settings say now. Sometimes stuff gets changed. Um, and don't let your guard down. Um, when, you've, when you've got your personal computer and you're about to hand it to someone for them to use for, for whatever purpose, just ask yourself, do I trust this person with my computer? It's not that I don't want you to be untrusting of people. Um, but really just consider, just consider that there may be personal information that you want to remain secret on your system. Um, be careful. Be careful what you, what you do and um, just always, always be vigilant. 
So I've mentioned cybersecurity. It's a systematic approach. I've just given you a list of things that you can that you can practice um, to protect yourself and your online presence. Um, I showed you the seven domains. I didn't go into all the technical details of how IT professionals protect your information online. That's beyond the scope of this discussion and much too technical for, for, this, for this speech right now. Um, protection, like I said, it's a protection of digital assets within the seven domains. It's a joint effort with everyone involved who has access. That's you, that's the people running the internet service, that's the people providing the applications online that you're using. It's a layered defense. It's not just one security implementation. You saw my list of, of recommendations was, what, three slides? And everything else I had on one slide each. Um, so it's a layered defense. It's a list of things. It's a whole bunch of things that you do to, to achieve a certain level of security. It's a continuous effort. It's not a one and done. You have to do it over and over and over again. You have to stick with it. You have to be vigilant. And it is something to be understood and implemented. It's something that, every, that people should just, in general, be aware of. Um, that they should be wary of when you're browsing your email, when you're browsing the web. Um, you should just be wary that attacks will come that way. Um, and you need to be looking for them. Um, some interesting attacks. USB kill uh, is an is a interesting one that I found online. Be careful, their, uh, their little tagline on their website said, be careful once you pick up and plug into your computer. This particular device looks like a USB memory stick, a storage device, um, but what it actually is, is something far different. It doesn't store data at all. It's designed to collect the power that's used to generate, or to, to power your USB devices. When you plug a USB stick into your computer, there's power that goes to it so that it can operate. What their device does is it collects this power and builds it up in a capacitor. And then it releases it back out through the data lines of the USB. And it's capable of just frying your computer, just no good anymore. Um, and according to their website, they said over 90% of systems on the market are vulnerable. And they made this device and they're making it available for people who do penetration testing, different tests um, to see if systems are secure. They're making it available because they want to increase the awareness of this problem. It's a big problem and they want people manufacturing computers, businesses and companies to put protective measures in that will protect against this kind of an attack. Um, keystroke loggers. Keystroke loggers can be something that's a piece of software, a program that's running on your computer just recording every key that you press. They can be little devices that get plugged into your computer and then the keyboard plugs right into them. And all they do is they collect this information and then an attacker comes along later and pulls all this information off. So maybe you can get usernames and passwords and all sorts of sensitive information that was typed on the keyboard. Wi-Fi attacks. Um, I've already mentioned some, uh, but imagine you're sitting at a coffee shop and someone sets up a fake, well, it's not fake, it's real, but they set up a Wi-Fi access point and they, they call it Starbucks. Now you walk into the, the coffee shop and you go, oh, look, Starbucks says free Wi-Fi, connect. And unknowingly, you've connected to the attacker's wireless network and not your own, or not Starbucks's, rather. You've connected to the attackers, and now he can see everything that's going back and forth between your computer. Again, hopefully you're using HTTPS so that that information is encrypted. But if it's not, an attacker who takes this kind of approach can view everything that's going back and forth. But not only can he view, a person doing this could modify the content in the web pages because he's sitting in the middle. He could get the web pages as they come back on their way to you, and when he receives them, he could change content on the page. He could add some advertisements, or he could add malicious scripts and then pass them back on to you. So Wi-Fi attacks are very interesting. China's great canon. We're in China. It would, it, I'd be remiss not to mention this. 
Most of you have probably heard of the Great Firewall, yes? The Golden Shield Initiative. Um, China also has what's known as the Great Cannon, which is not so much a censorship device as an attack device. It's capable of collecting requests that people in China make to legitimate websites and altering them, just like I mentioned in the Wi-Fi attack to include malicious scripts. And these scripts could do something such as perform a denial of service attack where <clears throat> all the computers who made a call to this web page, say it goes out through the Chinese internet connection, the great canon goes, hmm, make some changes as the pages come back. And all of these computers run a script that the great canon inserted. And what the script does is it says, try to call up a web page on this server. Well. If you know anything about web servers, they can only handle so many requests at one time. And when you have a few hundred million people hitting, a, hitting one server at the same time, it tends to bring that server to its knees so that it can no longer perform its duties. It, it, it's a denial of service. So this has been used in, in the past against sites that sometimes China had problems with, or they were publishing content, or they were um, just information sharing sites that China didn't want people accessing. Um, and attacks would go out against these websites, and it would just bring the websites to their knees so that they couldn't operate. People then couldn't share information, they couldn't access information. Um, and it basically turned off those services. So it doesn't do anything to the individual it may not do anything to the individual. It could, potentially, um, but it may not. Um, and then this, this is what I was talking about, malicious content injection, um, where someone sits, someone sitting in the middle, and this could be your internet service provider, who's sitting there, and a lot of times, um, this is actually very common uh, around the world, not just in China, where ISPs will insert advertisements into web pages. They'll just you request a web page and the ISP sees the page coming through and it says, oh, throw this advertisement in there too. I'm guessing so that they can subsidize some of the cost of internet service um, and make a, little, make a little money as you're browsing the web. Uh, but it's also possible that they could inject malicious content, which has been recorded in a handful of different countries. Um, and like I said, denial of service is an interesting attack because it's not, it's not trying to steal information. It's turning something off. It's basically denying access to it. it says, they say, no, we're not going to let you access that. We're actually not going to let anyone in the world access it because we're going to cripple it. Uh, and it happens everywhere. It's not just China. These, these attacks happen all over the world. It's part of the reason it's necessary to keep your antivirus up to date. Uh, it's possible that your computer, if it's been infected by a virus, operates perfectly normally because it's a drone waiting to be activated by someone who says, go ahead, and send, participate in a denial of service attack against this person. And then once they hit that button, whoop, your computer's activated and you may not even notice it. And it goes out and it attacks that website, that web page on behalf of the attacker. So these, these are some of the interesting attacks that can come about. Um, I pulled the image out of one of the Jones Bartlett websites. That's all I've got for now. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Nicholas, um, for that great engaging talk. If somebody does have questions, yeah. I'm just going to ask you to take the mic so that the um, camera can pick up the audio. Yeah. And if you need to go, if you need to go, that's fine. You can you can take off. Yes, okay, hello. Are there, are there any questions? Yes, okay, um, if there's no questions, I have a question. Okay. So, I'm a simple guy. Um, uh, browser caches and cookies. Can you say something about that? I mean, they're supposed to enhance your web experience. Is this something regularly that I should yeah. be sort of clearing out? Or? Um, a browser cache, what it does for you is it, it keeps content that you fetched from the internet on your computer 
so that the next time if you want to call that content up again, it doesn't actually have to go out and retrieve everything. Um, whatever's in the cache, it can pull right off the hard drive, which is much faster than trying to download it from the internet. Your cookies store information about your interaction with a website. Uh, this could be login information. Um, it could just be your, your preferences for the website. I, I like to have this background on my email and I like to have it displayed this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and these kinds of things, some of them are just, are just there so that it can keep track of, of, yes, you're logged in and you're making these requests. Uh, oftentimes, the fear that you, that you would have is um, in some of the online scripting attacks where it uses JavaScript, uh, attackers might try to use this, create a script that would be able to grab cookies generated by another site. So if they could, for example, grab your um, the script that says you've auth or the cookie that says you've authenticated to this website, they could take that cookie and import it. And then when they made the call uh, any call to that website, it would say, oh yes, you're authenticated as so and so. Mm. Um, so that's the biggest fear there. Um, so is that something like uh, just in terms of keeping Vigilant that you know people should maybe clear out their cookies uh, more often. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's not a bad practice to clear out your cookies. Just be aware that if you do, you're going to lose like any right. references that you've set in websites, um, things like that. You're going to and when you clear your cookies, you're also going to get signed out of any websites that you're signed into. So, if you're having problems signing out of your email, which seems to happen with our email from time to time, uh, clear your cookies if you know how. If you don't, you can always ask me. But if you clear your cookies, it'll erase any record of that login, um, and then you'll be able to sign in again. Great. Okay. Thank you, Stephen or Daniel. Yep. Thank you for your talk, by the way. You're welcome. I'm going to go home now and curl up in the fetal position and, <laughs> and only use carrier pigeon from, from this point forward. Uh, I hope that's not necessary, but... Well, my, my question is, how does someone like myself, who has just learned much of these things today, how does someone know if their computer is one of these bad guys? It can be very difficult to detect. If you have antivirus software installed and the malware is known and it's detectable, then oftentimes the antivirus software will detect it. Uh, if you want to avoid this kind of stuff, um, a good rule of thumb is avoid free software that's available for download on the internet. Um, but things like Chrome and Firefox, which are web browsers, are also free. And of course, people are going to want to download those, but sometimes when you um, request a download, it will also say, do you want to also install this program with this toolbar or this, this other program that will do this for you? Turn those off because a lot of times those are the types of programs that may come with questionable um, elements built into them. The only way, if you're infected with a rootkit, um, that, that impacts your operating system at its very base level and it can hide itself from the operating system, in which case it can be well, well nigh impossible to detect. Um, and in general, I just I tell people if you know that your computer is or has been infected by a virus, back up your documents and files and reinstall from scratch. Because that's really the only way that you can be certain that if, if there was a rootkit in there, it's gone. Um, so especially in China. When I was running Windows, I would reinstall once a year um, because it, it was just questionable as to what was going on in the system sometimes. And it was usually within a year running Windows. And at, because of that, I just said, forget this. I'm, I'm done with Windows, personally. Uh, just because I got tired of it. Uh, I knew that there were viruses would get in there and I, I honestly wasn't even sure how they'd gotten in there. But oftentimes, your computer will misbehave. It'll start doing weird things. Um, you may see your, now your hard drive may spin for very other different reasons, but sometimes it'll just spin and spin and spin. Or it may get hot when your computer is doing nothing. 
It could be slow when your computer is not doing much of anything. Now, this could be the sign of a virus. It could be, it could be the sign of a bad hard drive, too. Um, it, it all really just depends. And once, once you start to notice that there are problems, that's when you have to really start looking and saying, okay, now what's causing this problem? Because if it's not hardware, there is a good chance something got onto the system <coughs> and needs to be cleared out. And I'd just like to ask one more question. I have a very old operating system. Mm -hmm. Is this to my benefit or is this to my detriment? Um, it's, if it's no longer maintained, it's probably to your detriment. It's mm -hmm. definitely to your detriment. So, for example, say you're running Windows 95. <laughs> All right, we'll go really old. We'll go really old. Say you're running Windows 95. Windows 95 does not receive security patches from Microsoft anymore. It is not supported. And in addition to that, it never had many security features built into it in the first place. So it was very vulnerable. Um, XP was one of the first Windows operating systems that, that came out with a good bit of security in mind. Uh, but even that today is not supported anymore. So if there exist any vulnerabilities in XP, and you can be sure that there are, um, that have been discovered or that will be discovered since Microsoft stopped supporting XP, all of those vulnerabilities are open for attack. And what that might mean is someone might be able to get into your computer system and just get administrator access to do anything he or she might have might want. Uh, it might mean that they just have access to, to take screenshots or something. Uh, it, it depends on what the vulnerability is as to what kind of access. But even a little access is dangerous because the idea for an attacker is to get just a little access. And once you have that access, try to elevate your privileges so that you can get more access. It's once you've got your foot in the door, you try to open it farther. But it's just a matter of getting your foot in the door oftentimes. So what may be a minor vulnerability could be your downfall eventually. <clears throat> and I definitely would not do anything online with a system that's not supported anymore, at least not anything that involves sensitive personal information. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Memo, you're good? All right. Another round of applause here for Nicholas. Thank you for a great round. Thank you all. Interesting talk. Chock full of wisdom. Yes. Too much wisdom, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you were happy until today.